Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce my the next speaker. Uh, we're going to have a great talk today about explainable deep neural networks for medical image analysis by Christoph Garris, who's an assistant professor at NYU Center for Data Science. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Christoph. Thank you very much. Um, OK, so uh, can, you, can, can you hear me very well? Uh, yes, we can. Right. OK, so great. So, you know, I'm going to speak about, uh, you know, explainable deep neural networks in medical imaging and also about my, uh, you know, about my uh, experience in uh, applying machine learning in medical imaging in general. Um, so a lot of my work is on breast cancer because it's a very interesting, uh, it's a very interesting application of uh, medical imaging for a number of reasons. Uh, it is a very common disease. So about 40 million people of uh, breast cancer screening exams are performed yearly in the US. And 200,000 of these women are actually diagnosed with cancer. And sadly, 40,000 of them lose their, lose their lives to cancer. So it's a very important uh, problem to solve from a societal point of view. And also it is very interesting from the machine learning, uh, from point of machine learning methodology. Um, here this is uh, what it looks like. These are the four views that the radiologists see um, when they are interpreting the breast cancer screening exam. And based on these, they are supposed to determine whether this person uh, might have cancer and needs some additional imaging or, or doesn't, and uh, they should just you know, go home. Um, so the way we formulate it as a learning task is that we take these four images, we use some learning model, and then on, um, and then we uh, use this learning model to produce four predictions. So because there are two breasts, uh, we produce a prediction of malignancy in the right breast and the left breast. And additionally, uh, we also produce a prediction of whether there is a benign change in either of the breasts. Um, and you know we use this so we use this benign prediction uh, as a regular as a kind of form of regularization. So it's uh, if you are familiar with multitask learning, that might ring a bell. Um, okay, so of course now these days everybody knows how to use machine learning and are everybody is a deep learning expert. But um, so if it's you know so if it's a very, if it was a very standard problem then. You could just you know download Keras or whatever your favorite uh, whatever your favorite software is, and then you would be we would be done. But unfortunately, this is a harder it is a harder problem in medical imaging. So uh, first of all, the public data sets that are out there are very tiny, and the hospitals are really not keen to share their data. And there are really there really are some genuine reasons not to do that. Uh, labeling data. On the pixel level, it's also difficult, both objectively, uh, meaning that it's just sometimes difficult to say whether there is a pixel, whether this pixel belongs to some malignant change. And operationally, it's just uh, it's just a really bumpy process to get this to get this data to a radiologist to draw this on a you know on a computer, then get it back somewhere else. It's uh, it's it's just it's pretty difficult to operationalize this on a large scale. And uh, medical image data also has very different properties than natural images. Uh, and neural networks, uh, like you maybe you have heard of, like ResNet or DenseNet or you know, EfficientNet, whatever networks you have heard of, uh, they have been designed for natural images, like ImageNet, right? So uh, because these medical image data has such different properties, it is difficult to directly apply them and get amazing results. Um, but nevertheless, we, you know, we, um, you know, and uh, and also the, the, the other problem is that the standard neural network architectures don't have any direct mechanism to explain their predictions. So if you just if you just use these uh, standard neural nets, it's just going to tell you, okay, this is thirty percent probability that this person has a particular disease. It doesn't really explain why. There are some mechanisms that. Uh, there are some additional mechanisms that uh, allow you to get some kind of approximation to these questions, but uh, it's, it's often it's often really difficult to interpret itself. Um, but nevertheless, we took the stab at this. We created some 
our private data set from NYU Langone Health. And we trained a moderately uh, standard neural network on, on that task. Um, so we took, uh, we took the resident architecture, we modified this a bit because there are four views. We had to, you know, we had to do some concatenation of these, uh, of these views for, to, to maybe uh, compare these, uh, to maybe compare those, uh, those different views to each other. And then we make predictions and, uh, you know, and, and, okay, so, so we make predictions and that's our network. Um, and we compared it to human performance uh, in a reader study. So we actually took 720 exams, uh, half of them positive and half of them, half of them with a biopsy and half of them negative. And we checked how, uh, how radiologists would do that, uh, would do in this uh, subset of the data. So we asked 14 of them to read, to read those exams and provide a probability, prediction of probability of malignancy. Um, so we here in this case, we just forget about this uh, task of uh, indicating whether there's a benign change, we only look at malignant changes because it's just how radiologists are trained. So it's easier for them to, it's easier for them to do that. And it's more, it's a better experiment to compare the two if we do this. And what we found was very interesting. So uh, individual radiologists are pretty good at this task, but um, so this is a UC in malignant prediction. So uh, so they are pretty good. They achieve approximately 0 0.8 AUC. If they were perfect, they would reach around. They would reach one. If they were totally random, they would reach a 0 0.5. Right. So they are. So they are pretty good, but they are not perfect. Of course, uh, radiologists are you know trained very well, but this is a very difficult task to actually to do. Uh, and surprisingly, our model uh, was slightly better than them. And we also found, but we found that. If we ensemble of these radiologists, then they can still outperform our model. But then further, if we took those individual radiologists and ensemble each radiologist with our model, we could do almost as well on average as this ensemble. And uh, yeah, you know, and if we even then take this ensemble of radiologists and then we add our model to that, it is even better, right? So it's a uh, so that's a, it's a very unrealistic result, right? You will never have 14 radiologists together and a neural network. So this is a really this is a really strong result already. Um, okay, but you know, so we so we took these uh, so we took these models and we put them online. Uh, you can play with them. Uh, you cannot really use them for anything commercial because of the license, uh, but because it's because of our license. But you can you know, but for scientific purposes or just for your own amusement, you can you can use these networks and they are really. They're really very good. There are actually, you know, there are many hospitals around the world that are trying to play with them as well right now to make sure that, uh, you know, to make sure that actually this is an interesting um, path of research for them as well. Okay, so, but is it the end of the story? Um, so even though this model is accurate and it is likely clinically useful as a second reader, uh, it is still, it has some flaws, right? So it is applying the same amount of computation to all parts of the image. Um, and that is, this is not necessarily an optimal solution from the point of view of how we would like to, how we would like to learn. Uh, and because these are very large images, uh, if we apply the same amount of computation everywhere, then we just cannot have a very complex network. And uh, this model also needs pixel level labels to achieve strong performance, which is not always very easy to get. And uh, it doesn't really explain why it makes a particular prediction. And uh, I think you would all agree with me that it's hard to trust uh, something that you just don't understand. And for that reason, we build these other category of models, which I call uh, models interpretable by design. So I'm going to show you one example of a model that we built like that. And I will try to convince you that uh, it is a great model and you should all use models like that if you, if you can. Uh, so this is a globally aware multiple instance, multiple instance classifier. And uh, I'm going to explain this model to you step by step. So first of all, this, so this model has uh, a few separate modules, right? So here, what you can see is the global module, which is taking this image and is using a relatively low capacity network to process it with some convolutional layers 
And then at the end of the network, it is instead of producing just one number, it is collapsing these convolutional layers into, uh, into two saliency maps, such that the saliency maps indicate what part of the contributes to the production of this network. So that technique is called weakly supervised localization. And uh, it has been applied before in, uh, in, in natural images and some medical images, but here we actually have done this on a very large scale. Um, so they're very interesting. So it's very interesting that even though you train this network just with the global labels that indicate whether this person has cancer or doesn't have cancer, this network on its own is learning to discover where cancer is, right? That's almost, I think that's almost like magic. Uh, there are some very good reasons why this is actually working, but nevertheless, that's a very interesting phenomenon. Um, okay, so the, so the great thing about this part of the network is that because it's indicating where cancer might be, we can have a, we can have, we can retrieve patches from this large resolution image and we can apply another network, which we call the local module, which has higher capacity. But because it's acting on a smaller number of patches, it's actually, it can learn from this, it can learn from these patches without running out of memory very quickly. So it is, uh, and you know, and then it's uh, taking these representations uh, computed from these patches, it's using some attention to weight them, and then it makes a predict. It makes prediction for these uh, for for this local branch, and then finally we have a uh, we have another module that fuses uh, what those local modules and global modules are learning. Okay, so um, now I'm going to show you just a little bit of uh, just just the only equation in my talk uh, because I would like you to understand this. So. What we are specifically had the way we are learn, we are training this network is we are training all three parts simultaneously. Uh, this is the loss function that we are using to train this network. So you can see that it has a part that's responsible for training the global model. So it is it is the binary cross entropy loss between the uh, between the label the correct label and the prediction of the of the network uh, specifically of the global part of the network. It is also training the local, the local uh, module and the fusion module at the same time. And additionally, we have this, uh, we have this penalty for, uh, for the saliency map such that we induce, we do sparsity on the saliency map, right? So we don't want, uh, so what it means is that we would like these uh, indications, uh, these local indications to be, to be sparse, right? We wouldn't like uh, we wouldn't like uh, some random dots on different parts because that's more likely to be incorrect. Okay, and um, these are a few examples, and as you can see, uh, it is actually working very well in this in these examples and many other examples. So here on the left, you have an annotated input. Uh, the network doesn't see this annotation during training; it's just uh, here for presentation purposes. Then in this next, in the second column, we have the patch map that the network found to be uh, the most important, and then those saliency maps, right? So, so green here indicates that the network thinks that there might be some benign change, and uh, here there's no malignancy, but it would be red if if there was, right? So, so you can see that uh, in the, in these examples, this network is actually able to fairly accurately localize these uh, localize these changes. Uh, the interesting thing is that sometimes, until biopsy, it is impossible to distinguish between benign and malignant changes, and this is also reflected here in how this network works, right? So you can see that it is, it, this network knows that there is nothing benign or malignant outside of these regions, but uh, but is unable to distinguish whether they are malignant or benign. Uh, sometimes it is actually even finding some some things outside of outside of this uh, biopsy region that uh, might be suspicious. And, uh, and also here it's uh, really, again, it's, it's, you know, it finds that it finds that this region is benign or malignant, but it's not really able to uh, determine whether, uh, whether it is indeed benign or malignant. Okay. And, uh, 
the interesting thing about this model is that it has this amazing property that is able to localize, but also it is very accurate because of this uh, architecture that allows it to apply a lot of computation at these uh, smaller regions that are salient. And what I'm showing you here is a comparison to a number of models. Uh, I won't go into details of these models, but you have to trust me that these are strong models. Uh, some of them are, so, you know, so so these models all use um, all of these models use uh, both pixel level labeling and uh, global labeling, while our globally aware multiple instance classifier or GMIC only uses only uses the uh, image label image level labeling, right? So we never really tell this uh, model where cancer is; it's just learning to discover that, and it's doing this incredibly accurately. So if we create an ensemble of a few different models, we actually find the AUC to be 0 0.93, right? So it's, it is a very high AUC for this problem. OK. And uh, even in, very interestingly, in some cases, it is even able to find some uh, changes which uh, radiologists themselves couldn't see. So these kind of cases are called mammographic occult. So on the, on the left, I'm showing you one case like this. So here, the radiologists uh, couldn't tell whether uh, there is any change and whether this person needs any further uh, further imaging. But because there's dense tissue, they were suspicious that uh, there, maybe there is something there. And they asked for an ultrasound. That's the ultrasound image. And they did find that this that there is a cancer, that this person does have cancer. But our model was actually able to find this cancer, uh, even even though, according to the radiologist, it's not visible in this image. So I think that's really fascinating that uh, deep, deep networks really can do that if they are trained in this way. Um, and again, this is also a model that we put on the internet. You can also play with this as long as you don't use it for commercial purposes. Um, and so the, both the model and the code, so the code is there, but also the weights of the model are there. Uh, we also applied a very similar idea very recently to COVID-19 deterioration. Um, and here we understand deterioration as whether this uh, patient will have a transfer to ICU, whether they will uh, need to be intubated or whether they will unfortunately die. And we set uh, four uh, time horizons to predict that for 24, 48, 72, and 96 hours. Um, and we used basically the same kind of network. It's, uh, it's almost the same kind of architecture, just with slightly different sizes. What we found is that this architecture, again, works uh, very well. And it's finding, and it's finding interesting regions of uh, interest in these images. And um, so that was very interesting to radiologists that uh, you can do this with this kind of a uh, with kind of a network where I think especially it's a very important for the kind of diseases where that are poorly understood, right? So you cannot really ask a radiologist to create pixel level labels for this for this disease because they don't really know what correlates with uh, deterioration that well. Like they they can make some guesses, but they don't really this, you know, COVID-19 is not well enough understood so that they could make a very, um, very certain, they're going to be very certain on this. Okay, so I think this is very well fitting in this paradigm of discovering knowledge from machine learning. And what I mean by that is that traditionally what we do is we look at, uh, we look at books, right? We talk to uh, domain experts and then we design some neural networks. But uh, now when we have these very large data sets like we do, like for example, in the breast cancer data, we have 1 million images that we learn from. We can actually do the reverse. We can learn something from neural networks and we can transfer it back to science. Or you know, we can have some insights that otherwise we wouldn't be able to have if we didn't train these complex neural networks. So in conclusion, uh, we have this very good model uh, that is accurate and could be used as a second reader. Uh, we can improve our results even further. Uh, our explainable model is uh, also a very accurate and it's applicable to other tasks, but there is still a lot of exciting uh, work. And um, I hope that I will 
uh, be, have a chance to speak about it again and show you more results. Okay, thank you very much. Um, these are the papers that I that I presented some results from. You can follow me on Twitter, and you can also write me an email if you have any questions about my talk. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, so. Thank you very much, Christoph. Um, I think unless there's uh, anything else on your end, people uh, in the chat are free to ask questions uh, to Christoph. And if you could stay a few minutes, Christoph, I know we have another time. Sure. No problem. I'm sure they would love to uh, mm -hmm. utilize this time to ask you directly. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so I see that someone, okay, Eric, uh, mentioned that I, yeah, I should hide my banner. Sorry, so, you know, uh, I hide it, I you know I hid it now, but I didn't see your I didn't see your, that you were asking me this during my talk. Any questions? So maybe okay. So maybe if uh, maybe you can think of the questions that will show you the equations. And so since that was a that was important to see. Okay. All right, okay. So, oh, I see, now there's lots of questions. Okay, is there another, okay, uh, another aspect towards explainability behind, besides focusing that we didn't mention? So I think, you know, so there's, there are two aspects, right? So one aspect is that, okay, so the wiki supervised learning, wiki supervised localization is very important, right? So basically what this network does, it's actually making a prediction and showing you where this prediction uh, stems from, right? So this is really, um, so this is really showing you not just, okay, that this person has some probability of cancer, but it's explaining you, okay, this person has cancer, because there is cancer at this location. So it's a very important property for medical imaging. Uh, because you know, like if you if you don't have this kind of explanation, then it's very hard to take any action on that. Okay, so the next question is for parallel resident concatenated, how this is making a difference. So it's a okay, so so this is a question from Prakash. So that's a, uh, so this is uh, from our previous paper. So we didn't do this in, uh, in this explainable network. So the reason why we have these four ResNet is that there are four views. Um, and, you know, the, the reason why we did that is because you might want to compare different views, right? So here we are, for example, comparing left and right. Left, so left, uh, so there are four views, and we are comparing like those kind of corresponding uh, and below views and the corresponding CC views. Is it making a big difference? Uh, it's not making a big difference. It's making a little bit of a difference. I think to actually uh, be able to really fully leverage this, we probably need a different kind of architecture that would actually allow some richer interactions between uh, these uh, 